This is Friday, September 23rd, 2022. This is our Society 2045 Friday talk series. We are uh, blessed today to have with us uh, our good friend, Jerry Mikulski. Jerry, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? Lovely to be here. It's nice to see a bunch of familiar faces. Looking forward to our conversation. So what we do here at Society 2045 is interview interesting people up to good stuff in the world. And we chose uh, the year 2045 as kind of a far enough out on the time horizon where we don't have to be too troubled by what's right in front of us. And we can start to look at the longer trends that might be coalescing around then that will lead us to a better place. Um, certainly don't expect all of our problems to be solved by then, but Hopefully we can get through the the kind of the eye needle here and be in a place where um, we'll be in a much better stance to uh, to create our future. So um, before I ask you to talk about that, I'm just going to ask you to please tell us who we, um, oh, what should we know about you? Do your own introduction here. Um, I, I, I used to call myself the accidental technology analyst because I was neither a journal, trained journalist nor a programmer, but I somehow found my, my first calling <clears throat> as a bridge between business people and geeks uh, trying to figure out what happened with like dot-com startups and all of that. Um, did that for a while. And then a couple of th two big things happened to me. One is this brain software that I'm still kind of addicted to, a, a piece of mind mapping software that changed how I remember things and my ability to access things. And the second is that um, I realized I didn't like the word consumer, which has kind of driven the rest, the, the, all the years since like mid nineties. And the word consumer led me to the word trust. <clears throat> so I care a lot about our shared memory. I care a lot about trust. Those topics mingle a lot and lead to a whole bunch of really interesting inferences, conclusions, theories, et cetera. So that's all, that's all territory that I'm, I love to explore and work on. So let's, um, let's dive into trust. Uh, you have a website called Design from Trust and a program called Design from Trust. Tell us, tell us about that a little bit. Yes, on website, not, it's not really a program yet because, um, for example, many of you are probably familiar with design thinking. Um, design thinking is a methodology. You can put it into a company. You can kind of bolt it onto any place and prototypes will come out. It kind of works. Um, the moment you start talking about trust, there's a piece of the process that involves looking in the mirror and a, a kind of reflection that companies will have to do because they're unconscious or unaware of a bunch of ways in which they're violating trust. So for example, lightly, the advertising model that is the principal funding model of the behemoths that we all depend on, that we're all critiquing right now, it involves multiple breaches of trust, one of which is you dumpster dive my data, my data and know much more about me than pretty much anybody understands they know. <clears throat> then you sell this data around. Then you apply all sorts of sophisticated technology to figure out how to dangle things in front of me, which is another invasion of my space. Uh, Jacques Attali wrote a book a long time ago where he said that noise is violence. And he was saying that, that sort of, you know, the advertisements that fill our space, fill our world are in fact a form of violence on us. So that's another breach of trust. And this is being done as a matter of course by companies that would like us to trust them. And it's like, unless you can have that conversation or enter into that space and realize that when you call people consumers, you're insulting them, not just addressing them, and that you should call them people or customers or clients. There's a bunch of really good words, members, stakeholders. Um, so, so for me, there's a, a lot of this played out from just paying attention to the language uh, that, that was happening. Terrific. I'm also of the opinion that uh, consumer is a terrible label. I don't want to be a consumer. Having read a lot of uh, English literature when I was in school, I, you know, especially the, the stuff from England in the old days, everybody was dying of consumption. So I don't want to be a consumer who dies of consumption. But I'm really interested in, in trust. How do you, um, going beyond what you just described in terms of what companies are doing, what might be some ways that they can um, remediate that? How can they How can they gain our trust back? Do you have thoughts on that? A, a bunch of thoughts. And, and I sort of didn't finish explaining this, this design from trust idea. <clears throat> so one thing is um, to become more aware of the uh, hidden architectures of mistrust is what I call them. There's a, uh, my little amateur thesis of uh, theory of history has a bunch of different kinds of assertions. One of which is that uh, many years ago, somewhere between 300 to 3000 years ago, we lost faith in humans. And then we got overwhelmed by the growth of population. So it's like, oh my God, there's so many people. And we industrialized everything. We basically said, oops, there's too many people. Uh, there's too many bad actors out there. Uh, so let's just turn everything into a lockstep march through progress, you know, into the, into the future. 
And so we have a compulsory education system. Our, our education system is industrial in structure. Uh, and then when a child enters the educational system, the first question is, okay, how old are you? <clears throat> and that means we're going to slot you in with kids who were born like within a year of you, which creates artificial scarcity from the get-go. Like, like from the get-go as a structural component of the, of the compulsory school system. Now, there's plenty of schools that are experimenting. I'm thrilled with some of the other leading edge ideas. And there have been a bunch of maverick-y school ideas over time, uh, dating back to Barcelona during the Spanish Civil War and a bunch of other interesting places. If you go peek under the hood, this has been tried in many places, but we lost faith in humans. And so how do you first detect the hidden architectures of mistrust in your particular field or domain. That's, that's, that's a starting point. A second thing is if you're calling those people consumers, shifting your language and your framing and beginning to understand what the framing means and how it affects you and your interactions with those people, we would like to trust you. And then a third thing could be how in fact do you build trust? And it, it ain't hard. Um, often it means telling the truth. Uh, a whole bunch of companies, for example, have skeletons in their closet like really big, nasty, smelly skeletons. <clears throat> and one of the things I was, I was trying to figure out is, could there be a world in which an organization like a company could call for, could invoke, could request a truth and reconciliation commission around mm -hmm. some issue so that in exchange for truth telling, they wouldn't be put out of business and have the ground salted where their building used to stand and they could still sort of you know, continue doing things, but then they could be honest with you. Right. So, so, so that sounds like a really big insurmountable thing, but there's plenty of companies with nasty skeletons that prevent them from opening the, the curtains or the doors and letting people in to see what, what's actually going on. <clears throat> Another really bad thing that's going in America is particularly egregious in this is uh, exorbitant executive compensation. One of the design from trust practices is called workplace democracy it goes under a bunch of other different other names and it's really, really hard to have workplace democracy when your executive is making 600 or 1,000 times more than the lowest paid worker in the company. That just, that's just not fair. It just doesn't work. So then when you say, hey, people set your own salaries and bonuses, which happens in a few companies that have workplace democracy, that ain't going to happen in, in a company that has that much disparity, that much inequality, that much inequity going on. So if you really want to sort of get into the path of design from trust, the, the place to aim for, I call becoming a trusted ally. And the way I explain this is um, I ask a mostly rhetorical question. I say, do you tell your healthcare nexus complex, do you tell them everything about you and your health? You, you know, your nurse, doctor, insurers, everybody else you touch in the health, do you tell them everything? And it's a rhetorical question because everybody's like, no, 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 no. System is designed to, to like pound my head. If, if any, anything is broken, pre-existing conditions, who knows what, the system doesn't respond well to that. What if you could? What if you could tell mental health practitioners, nurses, doctor, everybody, like really everything about you? And what if they, what if they had such a trusted relationship with you that they could sort of bring you behind the curtain and say, hey, we don't know everything about how the body works, but here's what we know. Here are the levers we can pull. Let us help you hack your, your life, happiness, well-being, and wealth, spelled W-E-L-L-T-H, not wealth, which is what your maybe your bank could be working on. Although your bank would be really smart to be also be working on your wealth as well-being, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there's all these opportunities that nobody's picking up because um, I would never leave my trusted ally organization. If I were their, their client, I'm their client for life. If they don't betray me, if they don't overcharge me, and if they get to know me better than anybody else knows me, I, it's going to be really hard to leave. That's a form of stickiness, right? Companies always want stickiness because everybody loves an annuity revenue stream more than like a one-off sale. Um, that's a way to get there, but it's like the moral high ground. And I think it's also such a challenge to actually be that way that your competitors are unlikely to be able to follow. So I think, I think there's a lot of like good capitalist sort of logic for being more transparent, getting the skeletons out of the closet, shaking them out, being fairer about comp, changing org structure. And I'll add one last thing for this way too long answer, which is um, part of my amateur theory of where we are is that we're in an involuntary renegotiation of the social contract and the business contract. And everything from capitalism and democracy down to C corporations and profit maximization and you know the role of money and wealth in the world, 
all these things are broken. People know they're broken. There have been a series of movements from Occupy to the Gilets Jaunes and the Arab Spring saying, hey, uh, my you know, Extinction Rebellion, my, uh, my kid's future looks worse than my present, that, that won't work. And so there's an opportunity now to actually wake up and say, oh, maybe I should go with this energy and change our company and change how we act in the world and be more trustworthy and all those kinds of things. And I think all those things play together really nicely. And they're so difficult emotionally and conceptually for your average good capitalist to pick up and do that I have not yet found the capitalist who wants to. Um, kind of a side note, we have on this call, Jose and Matt, who have written a book called Radical Companies. I encourage you to speak with them offline because they're touching on a lot of the stuff you're talking about here. Um, I just don't want to go down that rabbit hole at the moment, but I want to make that connection. Um, so somebody in the chat wrote, um, uh, curious what you mean, that what's the definition of the word trust as you're using it? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? So there's a, <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of different definitions and models for trust. Um, I just think that trust is sort of the, you can rely on somebody doing something in the future is, is a, a slimmest, lightest form of trust. And that does, Definition means that um, you can trust uh, Donald Trump, which may sound like a weird thing, but I'll make that point uh, with, a, with an easier example, which is Dr. Evil. I can trust that Dr. Evil is always going to try to kill Austin Powers, but he's not really going to be able to do it, so he doesn't have the ability to fulfill that, that mission, right? But, but, I, but I can trust that behavior. So with Trump, once you sort of figure out what his playbook is, what his favorite moves are, you can trust he's going to continue to do those things, even if you think they're awful. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people voted for him because they were trusting that he was the only candidate out there who was going to try to break the system, which is dysfunctional and broken, as I just described, which is a not unreasonable stance to take. Mm -hmm. In particular, because the other parties, the other players haven't picked up a better stance that I can tell yet. They're still trying to do business as usual, mostly. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, Grace on this call is, is busy trying to reinvent how we think of, of, of wealth and movement. Uh, Michael's been on this for years and years and years with let's and, and, and local currencies and, and uh, circular currencies. So, so we ha have sort of in the room people uh, who are actually doing the work, uh, but out in, out in like, I don't want to call it the real world because this feels like the real world here, but out in the, out in the bigger world, these are, these are not easy things. So one of the things that comes up when you start talking about trust with people is this idea of, well, if we trust everybody, then we have free riders. People are going to come and take advantage of the system. How do we build systems that discourage and minimize that behavior? I don't know if they can be eliminated, but at least, you know, it can be not something that's going to have a bunch of people going, I can't do this because these people are getting something they don't deserve. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's a bunch of different really interesting things here. Uh, one is that um, when I say, uh, one of the things I like to say is basically start with an assumption of good faith, you know, uh, start with trust. Uh, and that doesn't mean naive trust. It doesn't mean that, golly, nobody's going to do anything bad. There are no bad actors. It just means that when you start with an assumption that pretty much everybody's a bad actor, you design really shitty systems. Like, like the systems you end up in are systems nobody particularly likes or wants to exist inside of. Right. And so and so actually designing from trust, from an assumption of good intent on most people's uh, side leads you directly into big questions like, hey, free riders and also this tragedy of the commons thing, which I will I will drag that ugly old horse into the arena right now. Um, and, and there are, will always be free riders. I mean, uh, there, people are free riding on oxygen that's clean enough to breathe outside. And I mean, if you take a really expansive definition of free ridership, um, but the key here, I think, is managing commons effectively. So I have to bring a couple of things into the conversation. One is commons, eh? What do you mean? Is that like property? Well, sort of, but not really. And property and ownership are words that destroyed commons over time. Commons are shared resources. The oldest commons are forests and aquifers and uh, you know, clean air and things like that. But now we have modern commons, the digital commons. Uh, so Wikipedia is a very nice commons that looks like an encyclopedia that gets curated by a bunch of mostly volunteers uh, that is the resource for all of us. So, so the problem partly is that capitalism is a, a cuckoo. Um, do you know how cuckoos raise their young? But tell us, please. 
Cuckoos are brood parasites. They do not raise their young. They lay their eggs in other birds' nests. <clears throat> Those eggs, when they hatch, the chicks have this impulse, this reflex to push everything else out of the nest. So other little robin chicks or wren chicks fall to the ground and die. And then the robins come back and they're like, boy, Junior's big, but I guess we're going to feed him. Uh, and capitalism is like that with every other form of trying to survive together in community on the planet. So it demonizes, crushes, sucks the air out of, does because capitalism needs everybody to be in the labor pool, all the money to be available so that they can shake the world and almost try to break it like the 20, 2008, 2009 global financial crisis so that they can suck more money out of the system, et cetera. And I'm being a little cynical here, but I think I have a pretty jaded view of, of capitalism and its effects on us. And I think I'm surrounded by like-minded people, which is helping fan the flames here for me. So then I'll bring in what you need then is well-designed commons and governance for those commons. And here I'll point to the work of Lynn Ostrom, who all of us point to at this point in the conversation, because she won a Nobel Prize for economics, despite not being an economist, for the work she and her colleagues had done on governance models for the commons. And a well-governed commons does not happen naturally and easily. It's not like, ooh, gosh, there's the commons. Let's just live on it and everything will be fine. It actually needs to know who's in charge of it. What are the sanctions for people who violate the commons? What, what happens? How does this all sort of work? And there's a really nice book by Lewis Hyde, the guy who wrote uh, The Art of uh, the, 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 the gift. gift, The Gift, yeah. But he also wrote Common as Air. And in Common as Air, he talks about the commons and he says that in, you know, uh, in England way back in the day, um, maybe before or around the time, probably before the time of the enclosures, but around there, they used to beat the bounds of the village like once a year, which means they would, they would walk around the village kind of in a crowd, everybody together, correcting the mistakes or uh, th the different ways in which the commons were being invaded or broken. So if, if somebody had moved their a fence over into the forest that shouldn't be there, they would break the fence and reset it back where, where they should be or, or something like that. So there's all kinds of interesting things to, to know about the history of commons and how these things work. Um, but free ridership, and then I'll say one last thing about free riders, which is um, it's a little bit like vandals you kind of want to turn free riders into, into good actors and participants. The, the best thing you can possibly do is set up a governance mechanism that is really inclusive and friendly and warm and welcoming so that um, new arrivals who just want to take advantage of this cool thing are like, oh, hey, maybe I want to be part of this community, which means trail cleanup days in the forest, which means I don't know what else. But all of a sudden, they're helping maintain the commons instead of merely taking advantage of it. <clears throat> and then they're in. And then they're in. And part of my, my frustration and hatred of the word consumer is that when we were turned into mere consumers instead of being citizens, we lost our sense of responsibility and mutual interdependence. We lost our sense of agency to make changes in our world. And then our only job as good consumers is to buy more crap, even if we don't need it. And that's not, <clears throat> that's not a it's not a role that leads to anybody feeling good about their lives necessarily, unless all you're on is the hedonic treadmill. One of my biggest disappointments after the uh, attacks on 9-11 was seeing the American flag with shopping handles on America open for business. Like, really? This is our response? We're, gonna, we're just going to switch to going back to shopping? It's just that, nothing happened, you know? It's that was, very, all, very that was all George Bush had to say was he said, go shopping. It was incredible. It, it was like his father's terrible response after the fall of the Iron Curtain. There was this moment where a bunch of people needed to figure out how to govern better and we could have really actually helped. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that's a, a great segue into my next question, which is you and I have talked often about the fact that we live in an amnesic society and that um, indigenous people have a way of, of transmitting hard-won knowledge across generations, even if they don't have any written means to do so. So I'll take, for example, the great flood in California of 1862, where the entire Central Valley was flooded. In fact, I, I read that it flooded from Oregon to San Diego to Utah. It was an amazing atmosphere wow. river event. And interestingly, none of the indigenous encampments were underwater. Now, there hadn't been a flood like that for something in the, on the order of 150 or 200 years, but they knew in their, their culture, carry that along that information don't build below this line or you could be flooded out and we seem to have lost that ability to carry with us our hard-won knowledge of what do you do when you see fascism rising and what do you do when you see this kind of threat or that kind of threat 
how do we address this amnesia? What, what, what do you have for ideas? And I know you've got a lot on this, so I want to you know, toss this over to you. What can we do about this? How can we remember what's important? Good Lord. Um, okay, pop open another big can for us. It's a, it's a lovely question. And, and I'll add to your question, kind of, what do we do about the fact that it seems like students are disengaged and maybe like really dumb and citizens are really dumb and falling for like these plots and other kinds of things. Uh, you know, uh, the ex-president is wearing QAnon pins and playing QAnon music because he knows that he can play to a 20% of the country that's bought a series of highly implausible and actually kind of crazy plot lines that were there to be picked up, um, which are based on little tiny shreds of doubt and fear and fact, like, you know, a lot of mothers who worry about vaccines and so forth. Hey, come on in. We've got a big community doing this. And I'll point out that um, behind QAnon, behind 8chan and 4chan, uh, behind all of these curtains, are people building community and giving each other high fives for having done something cool and interesting, feeling like insurgents inside of a system that's broken. Mm. I just wanna empathize with them for a second because, mm. because that's partly why they're there is that everybody around them is doing this and it's in the air and I got community now, right? So, so you have to, you know, when Hamas does a better job of taking care of Palestinians than any other government agency, people are gonna love Hamas and Hamas knows that. Right. Going back to our pre our, our pre game show here, talking about Scarface, you know, Al Capone was beloved by his community because he fed them. You know, people did not want Al behind bars. He fed the community. So this is key. We we have to attend to community, which again, community is also a commons. I think. But exactly. Oh, back to you around amnesia here. Total, totally agree. So um, so one of the things I, I believe is that humans are actually pretty smart and that we've been dumbed down by how we've been treated. It's sort of like a learned helplessness, which is by the way, what Marty Seligman was studying before he turned to happiness. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. He was like, ooh, this is a really sad topic. I should find something better. Um, and so there's a bunch of reasons why I think we're amnesic. And one of the sort of forces at play here is that the copyright industries. Mm -hmm. And so, so anytime a new technology showed up that might mean we violate some copyright, so cassette, tapes that the, the, the recording industry hated the music industry hated cassette tapes and there's a thing called the american home recording act that finally got passed where there's a tax on every blank cassette sold because you might just record songs and pass them to your friend as as a mixtape or whatever and when the internet shows up all these companies really freak out and the internet manages somehow still today to sort of bypass a lot of this where I have way more stuff to watch and read than I can possibly watch and read, which is not being locked down and taken away from me by digital rights management or whatever else. So, so that's kind of interesting. But, but in the process, we got accustomed to not storing and sharing and remixing stuff for each other. So we are drowning in the information torrent and we have very few reserves of shared memory. And the mm. quest that I'm on right now with Open Global Mind is to try to figure out how do we build a shared global brain that's more than Wikipedia, builds on Wikipedia. I adore Wikipedia, but builds on it so that we can express what we believe and why. So that a QAnon fan can say, here's what I think happened and here's why. And we can stop and slow down and go, well, can we look at these things? And, and that can easily be 4,000 rabbit holes that go down because the people inside of these games know that if you just complexify things and obfuscate long enough and flood the zone with bullshit, which is a, a tactic, it, the, the fact checking is endless, it, actually endless, can never stop. And so you never end. So, so there's a whole other piece of this, which is about um, the building of trust and just being able to actually approach people who are other than you, uh, or, and maybe even who've been othering you and have a conversation that's reasonable so that we can start to figure out how to sort the world out together. So, so the copyright industries have it so that we don't even have a reflex anymore to try to save stuff and share stuff. And I had the weird good fortune 25 years ago of having a little startup come through our office and pitch me this mind map called the brain, which I started using a month before they released it to the public. And I still use the same data file. Can everybody on this call, uh, I know for a fact is in my brain and has been in there for a long time. And current events are in there, things I care about, but important issues are in there. And this, this triggered in my head, oh my God, 
uh, and, and it's a personal reservoir of what I've seen worth remembering, but I regret entirely that it's not a social reservoir. I want this to be multiplayer. I, and that's the quest I'm on right now. It's like, what does a multiplayer global mind look like, right? Because then we could put these things out in front of each other persistently and come back and improve and, and set up experiments and find researchers. And then those nuggets could be nibbled on by scientists or researchers on the other side. And students could actually go and look at the actual same data sets and use them. And journalists, when they're making a story, would find the original data sets and the people who did the research. And all of this stuff could turn into policy. And, and so solving the amnesia thing through a little bit of technology and a lot of trust I think, I think could take us back into a space where we could start solving the looming crises that are right in front of us. Because as far as I can tell in this very strange moment that we're in, we, are, we in the US are fighting for this not to become the handmaid's tale as a nation, when in fact, we ought to be desperately trying to figure out how to stop all the machinery from spewing carbon, how to capture and sequester more of it, how to stop, how to replenish the aquifers and do all these other great things that aren't they're not rocket science, I'll say weirdly. Um, but you know, healthy regenerative agriculture is a fabulous avenue for capturing lots of carbon, <clears throat> capturing lots of water, feeding lots of humans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can we just get everybody on that train and, and do that lather, rinse, repeat on regenerative ag everywhere? Okay, good. Next. Um, and so indigenous cultures around the world had a lot of hard-won knowledge. Uh, humans are really good at killing themselves off. Uh, you know, Easter Island is kind of just one spectacular example because it's a little island, but, but really we're very good at killing each other off and often we've killed each other. But in the cultures that survived, they passed down before writing. And, and once you get writing, it turns out you deprecate oral culture. Like you're like, ah, orality is nothing. Forget about orality. Like writing is it. Writing is the only game in town. Wrong answer. Um, orality is really important and really interesting. And a lot of cultures, uh, a lot of knowledge was passed down you know, generation by generation by memorizing things, famously songlines in, in uh, Aboriginal Australia, which are, songlines are super interesting. I only have a, a little understanding of them. I'm reading a book about them now, not the Chatwin book, which is okay, but really superficial. And, and songlines are sort of like a map of the territory, kind of like a, like a triptych from AAA. They're a, a story of the myths of everything you're going to run into on that trail. Like those rocks used to be like Gorgon sisters, and that over there was an anteater, and they went into battle. But also liens and property rights and access privileges and stories of what happened along those places are buried in and recorded in the song line. And these were memorized and passed down generation after generation. It's super, super interesting. And just to make a little link to the, mo the modern present, I kind of think of song lines as the original blockchain. Hmm. Interesting. Because they're kind of an immutable memory formed of blocks that are connected up that, that, that record stuff that happened, right? And, and I'm not thinking that the blockchain is gonna cure our amnesia, but it might be a component in there. I, I don't think Web3 is actually working on this problem very well yet. I think it's, you know, the, the solutions on deck are really confusing and, and kind of messed up. But for me, I'd just be happy if we could have multiplayer global brain where we could talk to each other and say, I believe this because, and, and kind of all the sentences I'm uttering in this conversation are in my brain in some fashion, because that's how I use this memory, mm -hmm. right? So I, I have a thought in there. I have lots of thoughts about Trump and his playbook, his favorite tactics. That's a huge web of things. Uh, I have a thought called, uh, we're in a Titanic battle over the narratives in our heads, and we always have been. The, the story of history is basically a fight in the cockpit over the joystick of who gets to control what the narrative is going to be for our culture for the next period. Mm -hmm. And then we wind up under dysfunctional narratives for a couple hundred years, right? Which can't be dislodged and which then affect the future in gigantic ways. That, that's the, the, the future we're kind of in right now. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop. That was, you, you keep opening very juicy uh, topics where everything is connected. Well, before I open another one, uh, I want to open the conversation up to the, the studio audience here. Uh, I'm sure some of you have questions for Jerry because it'd be easy. Jerry and I can talk for hours, and I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, it's true. Go on too long here. So, um, are you, you going to add a laugh track in later? We are. Yeah. Um, perfect. Perfect. So, who would like to post something to Jerry while we have him here? So I have a quick I can question. Just chime in and. 
Oh, sorry, I just put a quick one in the chat, maybe just to pick up on what you just referenced, Jerry, in passing about Web3. I think so, there's a lot of misconceptions and, and, and maybe it's not so useful to, to get hung up on the term, but I'm just curious because I haven't seen you around the space, you know. I th in my view, there's a lot of interesting stuff, actually. So, um, so Charles's question, as he wrote it in the chat, is what is Web3 and how much have you looked through? Uh, thanks, Charles. Uh, and so the Web3 is kind of complicated. There were early versions of Web3 or people were calling things Web3 that had little to do with crypto, uh, but now it's kind of like the crypto future, uh, which involves DAOs and NFTs and a bunch of other sorts of things, and also distributed open ledgers and a variety of things. And from my perspective, so my, my, my junior varsity uh, take on Web3 is um, Web3 includes some of the component piece parts for our future platform or our future infrastructure that somewhere 100 years from now, they're going to look back and go, oh, we use this, 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 and this. But, but the visions that I hear of how Web3 is going to work out and how we will all, we'll all just have smart contracts and everything is reducible to contracts. And then we'll, we'll sort of put rewards on smart contracts inside of a DAO and we'll bid on those. And that's going to somehow even out to to work to to guide a community to doing things, I don't actually buy that. I think it's a it's a heavily libertarian uh, kind of worldview that doesn't take care of commons, that doesn't do a bunch of other things. So, so my critiques of Web three are that I think that a lot of Web three culture winds up being bros who give each other access to private Discord servers when they buy when they have enough money to buy an NFT, and aren't doing enough thinking, although there are some communities that are, about how does this affect how we deal with each other and how we manage commons and what happens to us in the future. I think there's there's a few communities trying to do that, but broadly, the stuff that's getting pressed, the stuff that gets the most attention is a pretty dysfunctional culture as far as I can tell. And I may be overgeneralizing, Charles, uh, let me know, jump back in. I think Grace can most likely speak much better than me on, on a lot of this, but um, where I'm where I'm hanging, it's it's totally not the case, and and I just happen to find some communities that care and, and that uphold certain values and, and go in certain direction very much in the in the comments. Um, so you know, c come around and maybe you'll you'll see some stuff. Thanks. I love that. And Grace is next in the queue here, so. Actually, Matt, Matt and Charles talk, started to talk at the same time. So Matt, did oh, you want to? True. Yeah, and then I'll I'll get to you in a second, Grace. Matt, your question. I, uh, I'm more when it comes to Web three. I'm more on the on the Jerry side than than anything else. Uh, crypto has its value. It has a lot of value, and the blockchain has a lot of value. That's it. Uh, the rest of it is just noise. Um, no, the question I was going to ask is: Have you written anything, Jerry? <laughs> um, so I had a book disaster back around 2000, 2001, where I wrote three drafts of a book that started from the word consumer and my problems with it never got published. And I've just been digging up, uh, uh basically the old drafts been, been with the goal of maybe doing something with them. Um, and then I, I spent a dozen years kind of before that as a tech industry trends analyst, writing a lot of research that is not on the net. So I've been scanning some of that and trying to put it on the net. So so yes, I've written a whole bunch and guess what? Most of all that bulk of what I wrote way back when isn't yet available properly. And one of my goals is to sort of avert myself. I wanna, I wanna take what I've got and put it out there. What I've enjoyed doing a lot, and maybe this is because of the brain, um, I think very nonlinearly, I think very associatively, I'm a pattern finder and narrowing things down to serial words for 60,000 words at a time or something like that is kind of unappealing. Um, and a piece of what I'd like to do with this global brain of some sort is rethink how books work. And for me, a book is a playlist of chapters, chapters or playlists of nuggets that are sort of ideas. And I would like to publish a book concurrently with three other authors where we reuse one oh. another's chapters. And where each of us pressed a button that said, take this playlist of elements, add some front matter and end matter, turn that into an EPUB and send that over to Kindle Direct Publishing and let's, and, and, and let's, let, let's do that again. And then let's three or four of us who've done this go on the road, maybe virtually, and talk about how our ideas intersect. And, and this includes people who might point to the same nugget and draw very different conclusions from them, right? I, I'm, I'm happy to sort of have a very different idea about what Carl Polanyi said about commons and, and so forth way back when, because other people read other things into him. Cool, let's do that, right? But, uh, well, 
Uh, Gail is asking in the chat, more like FedWiki than a book. I don't fully understand FedWiki. I love Ward Cunningham. I'm friends with him. He lives here in Portland. Um, and I can't use FedWiki because vertical window after vertical window and the little tiles at the bottom don't actually work in my head. Where weirdly, a screen full of the brain, I am completely oriented, even though my brain contains half a million nodes in it now. I, I just passed that mark a couple months ago. Um, I am always located and centered and know where I am and know where I can get to and waiting to collaborate with people in FedWiki or in Rome or in some other tool, but that's like still like ahead of us. But thanks for asking, Gil. Yeah, so, so yeah. I sent you a link, uh, I think I call, I call RMIC, uh, which is about the multiple authors and stuff like that, so. Brilliant, love that. Okay, but yeah, I, I encourage you to, to, as much as you can, serialize, because you talk really fast, man, and you, you're all over the place, but there's a center to it, okay? Yeah. But um, a lot of your ideas are, are worth spreading and people consume serial shit. Thank you. And, and I was going to add, the thing I love to do is short videos and screencasts and braincasts. So I've got a whole bunch of them. I've got a bunch, bunch of playlists on YouTube <clears throat> where... Uh, you know, you can see a bunch of things that I'm thinking and doing. And I, I love when I give a speech, I try to make sure that it goes online openly, et cetera, et cetera. So I've got, so I'm, I'm happier and sort of friendlier in this short video mode and trying to do a, a, a bunch of that, but I need to go back into, into writing mode. And, and I'm counting on the pause and rewind and play slower functions so that I can pack a lot. I can, I can speak in burst mode, but any, any listener can actually avail themselves of the technology to slow me down. Okay, cool. Better than Quaaludes. Okay, uh, Grace. And I was just two days with Crypto Bros. And so um, I have to say I'm more on Jerry's side than Charles' side on that one, man. It is really shocking how much of the industry is just, uh, it's just amazing. Wow. Um, you know, it's just chilling and trying to get you to buy some meaningless NFT. And if you don't, I, I just, I've been to, I think four or five crypto conferences this summer. And most of them were on that side. There's one, one or two that I went to that were more on the regeneration side. But even on the regeneration side, you really see this kind of, well, if only we could raise the money, then we're going to do this thing. And there's just this, yeah, and competitive, right? Like you're competing with each other people for your token versus my token. So even if you've got you know, five regenerative projects, they're competing. With you. It's the same thing you see in nonprofit. And so there's a real lack of transition out of this monetary thinking and competitive thinking. So I have to say that, yeah. But that's not why I raised my hand. Um, awesome. I raised, I raised my hand because that's interesting, right? Because you've been talking about indigenous cultures and oral culture and songs. And, you know, uh, it's funny because I'm a Jew and, and I've kind of noticed yeah. more and more how a lot of what I've got maps onto indigenous culture. Maybe it's the indigenous nomadic culture or something. And it's something like, um, we're called the people of the book, but our oral tradition has always been really important. And even when it was written down, because we weren't supposed to written, write down all that Talmud stuff, right? That was the oral tradition that somebody decided to write down. But even so, when they did write it down, they wrote it down with five different opinions, not like, oh, this is the wisdom, but hey, you're supposed to debate about that. And today, that's what people do. They debate about this. And so that there is an oral tradition. And I was thinking about when I brought my son in to learn for his bar mitzvah, because the thing that you kind of have to learn is the tropes. The tropes, until recently, there was no way to record the melody of how you read the scriptures. And the scriptures were always read in tropes, I believe, because your voice carries better if you're kind of in, in a sing-songy way. But those tropes are not written, um, you know, they're written in the scriptures, but different traditions sing them differently depending on where you're from in the world. And that's also part of the oral tradition. And when you bring your child in, I mean, theoretically you could go online today and have your kid memorize how to sing them and learn how to sing them online, but nobody does. You always bring your child to a teacher. And I remember, um, bringing 
my child to this teacher and he's an old, I mean, he's not around anymore. He was a Holocaust survivor. Um, you know, all, one of the older, more respected people in our congregation. And he goes, I think we can tell him now, right? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I don't know what he's talking about. He's like, yeah. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, uh, okay. He's like, we can tell him that God didn't really write the scriptures, that they were written by people. And it was just very funny. It was like this, there's still an oral tradition. And the other thing that struck me was you were talking about the um, survival of these people in the floods and I was and you also mentioned the vaccines and it's actually interesting that different rabbis have ruled differently on that and one of the reasons that they've ruled differently on that 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 the rabbis where you're very religious um, we have purity laws and so if women's cycles are disrupted all the rabbis know really quickly because when you can have sex is an important thing and everybody knows and so some of the rabbis have ruled against the vaccines for women and children and some of the rabbis haven't, which is also a survival thing. And you can see that some of the tribes will survive and some of them won't, depending on which was correct. So it is really interesting to me, like when you were saying that, how this ancient tradition, it doesn't, it, it, there's nothing in the Bible about vaccines, but there's something about women's cycles that somehow became relevant in the most recent round of vaccines. And I, I just found that really interesting. Um, Grace, thank you. I didn't know about that that latter part. Um, that's super, super interesting. And then uh, Talmudic commentaries are the original hypertext. So, hey, thank you. Know, thank you. Mr. Breitbart. Jerry, I was just curious, you had mentioned your brain and then that sort of meta dimension of people's points of view relative to and I was wondering whether you would cross paths with the Society Library Project. Oh, for sure. Uh, Jamie? Yeah. Um, so, yes. Yeah. I, because it, we're actually, um, Carl, Evan Strait and I are actually like talking to Jamie about uh, the Society Library meets the brain. So Carl is a, a GSA, <laughs> GSA employee, longtime brain user, and in, in, in many of our OB, OGM conversations. And Jamie yeah. has been as well. So she's come, she's come through. And then there's this thing called Canonical Debate Lab, uh, which is kind of in the middle space and is working on some of these issues. And many members of Canonical Debate Lab are in uh, Open Global Mind as well. Uh, it, it, I, there's just so many different facets to this. I mean, one one little beautiful, interesting sliver is debate and argumentation. Like if I have a formal argument to make, how is that shaped? How do I represent that? Uh, how do I put in facts, uh, opinions, whatever, like pretend you had an Oxford debate with a proposition and then pro and con stances and, and so forth. Like how is that modeled? Where is the data? And how do you then do combat inside of that digital commons. That's super, super interesting. And there's uh, a couple dozen entities uh, that are busy doing interesting work just in that space. And then if you start looking around at the bigger picture of how do we do this as a society, there are just dozens and dozens and dozens of spaces like that one that aren't are necessarily aware of who's next door. And so a piece of what I want to do and like to do and haven't done enough of is be like the bumblebee that sort of goes from, from flower to flower and says, hey, 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 there's a really tasty flower right over there. Y'all should meet. Y'all should talk because some of what you're solving, they need. And some of what you haven't thought of yet before they've solved. And, and I think we need to remix and, and, and do a lot of that in the world to, to try to stand up this thing so we can be less amnesic and more conscious, more present. You need to practice your waggle dance, Jerry. I like that. I like that. That's what they call it. When bees find a, a, a new food source, they do a waggle dance. And, it, you know, depending upon how much, uh, how attractive the dance is, bees follow them. So, you know. And it's such an easier thing to remember than stigmergy. <laughs> yes, indeed. Mark. This is fascinating. And I'm, I'm relating it to the idea of the knowledge base. So I've designed for a global knowledge base that would be a geographic information system. You design sustainable economies in parallel. The scale at which you design each one is the ecoregion, which is the consistent pattern of the ecosystems that was mapped in 2000, 2001. There's 167 of them. And um, the idea that 
that you would model the economy and the natural world in the natural, the economy is designed to operate off the surplus of the natural world. And everybody gets to say what's going on all the way down to what they're doing. So it's fractal, it's, it's fine granularity of data. Um, like I say, what's going on in my garden. And then that gets aggregated. So a scientist looking at a particular problem for that ecosystem can help tease out solutions by you know by working with the community of science and the community on the ground but anyway the idea that the the kind of discussions you're talking about could be nested into the topics in the eco in the knowledge base so you create a framework a, a scaffolding for these conversations that in you know, the bumblebee is going to check out and you know you could you could also be pointing to these are the places and here's an expert system designed to solve this particular question and you can contribute to it and so that becomes a way of creating a um Teilhard de Chardin style noosphere um mark thank you for for what you just described it's really really interesting <clears throat> geography uh, sort of like mapping to the land is one of these other dimensions and a huge sector out there not everything is geographic but boy when you talk geography it gets really interesting quickly you probably know but probably everybody on this call doesn't know that john wesley powell who explored the west of the Mississippi, basically the country west of the Mississippi, lost an arm in the Civil War, had himself tied to a chair in the middle of a little boat, and went was one of the first people to navigate the Colorado River that way, like with one arm, like shouting commands. Um, he sent to Congress a map of the country west of the Mississippi and proposed that states, be, states' boundaries be drawn along watershed lines. Basically, the ridges would mark the edges of states. And of course, this was in the Civil War. We're busy with uh, Manifest Destiny, and there's this slavery thing going on. So the structure of our states has everything to do with slave versus free soil states and a, a bunch of really crappy politics and, and the formation of the Senate and a bunch of other things that happened like roughly, you know, earlier than that. But, but all of that comes into being in a very dysfunctional way. And one of my wish list items is could we reorganize the country along watersheds and then could we crowdsource data and get scientific data to meet, meet and mingle somewhere in the middle with some understanding of how reliable each data set is? Whether underground is people's heat kit, you know, weather stations on their homes, piped in, piping in information into a shared space, which is brilliant. Some people adore GISs and mapping, and there's OpenStreetMap and ArcInfo and a bunch of really interesting players in that space. I prefer the open stuff to the proprietary stuff by a lot. But in following the Ukraine conflict, there, you know, Arc, Arc, uh, uh, Arc Info has some very important maps about where the curtain battle lines are, all that kind of stuff is there. But but a lot of people aren't interested in geography, the place thing doesn't hold to them, and the GISs aren't the right wrapper or environment within which to do their daily thing, whatever it is going to be. So partly I'm trying to figure out is, how do the GIS enthusiasts and the people who are doing everything you just described meet up with and share in info and mingle brains and have idea sex with the people who are busy doing philosophical abstract stuff about what's what is like syndico anarchism anyway and why should we go there instead of this other thing and how does metamodernism affect policy decisions and what we're doing that's interesting to me too with other people using other tools in different ways and let us each find our way into the communities and the tools that work best for our priorities, our interests, and our preferences. That's messy. And so tongue in cheek to give this space and this scaffolding, I love that you use that word, a name, I bought the domain thebigfungus.org. But I'm borrowing here from the mycelial uh, world and from the wood wide web and saying that metaphorically, and it's a lovely set of metaphors, um, that the wood wide web is a really beautiful metaphor for how this system could work in, you know, in real life among humans. And uh, one of the things people don't know is that trees can't break down minerals, but they need minerals. So what do they do? They swap sugars for minerals with fungi who attach uh, down in the root system. And there's this exchange of nutrients and, and, and information running as chemical signals that are running, you know, never mind the critters that are running around. Uh, all this stuff is happening under our feet. And we've only become aware of it recently. Last decade or so is when this stuff is sort of like coming up. Awesome. That is a much better and healthier metaphor for where we as humans ought to go than any industrial mechanistic kind of metaphor. And then how do you then marry that back up to actual data kept in actual GIS systems and other sorts of databases? 
How do you know that it's reliable? How do you know that I'm actually me and not some avatar synthesized? These are all the cranky problems that, that crop up very quickly once you start getting serious about trying to solve for the bigger picture. Jose, you're going to have the last question. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, the, the, the trust thing really intrigues me because the way I perceived it, and I, I suspect that this isn't the case, but the way I perceived it is that you're thinking of trust as a social factor rather than a personal factor. So I don't know that one person on an island needs to worry about trust. But I trust. So, so trust is inherently social. Like it, it like the, the, to bring up the topic of trust requires at least two people. So it's a social. It's a social. I trust phenomenon. that the sun will be up tomorrow. Is that a kind of trust, or is that just like observation? I, you could say that. I agree with that. But I think that trust, as we're sort of dealing with it, is like an interpersonal phenomenon. Okay, and so, but it's still held personally. Yes. Oh, oh. and it's, it, it, you know, your mileage may vary. Every individual trusts other individuals at different levels in different ways. Trust is kind of has a lot of mathematical properties. It's kind of transitive and associative. You know, the, the reason the reason advertisers use celebrities is that we like the celebrity and that rubs off on the product and go read Robert Cialdini's terrible book, Influence. It's a great book. And a lot of people have used it to convince us to buy crap we don't need. He's not on, he's sort of on my shit list. <laughs> uh, even though he's sort of trying to patch up for what he's done, but and and that's kind of my question. If we think of this as a system of trust, where we're we're using it to manipulate our relationship with people, does it risk doing the same thing? If if we start thinking not about the people, but about how we can manipulate trust to engage people, so. Um... You may be asking like five different questions here, but I'll ta I'll tackle the one I think I, I understand that you're asking. Um, so if you if you look at nudge policymaking, right, that comes out of uh, a bunch of work on default settings and things like that, nudge is also looked at as some sort of terrible paternalism because in, in nudge uh, you set a default that is that greatly increases participation or usage or membership or whatever because we don't change default settings very much that's just part of human nature but the person who sets the default to whatever that default goes to is making policy and making a decision for the larger group of whatever that thing is whether it's by default when you join a company all your money is going to go into this you know this uh mutual fund or something like that right um so Unless we're in communities and looking at why we're making decisions and why these policy things showed up the way they did, you can't sort of really trust where those decisions are and how they're being made. They're just, you know, it's a smoke-filled room, which I guess is an anachronism these days when smoking is so, uh, is nearly gone, but not quite. But it's totally systems of trust and all the players have different weightings and values for all the different players. But we need to find our way forward so that we can live inside of communities that we trust under policy regimes that we trust and understand so that we can behave well together. And, and, and today's world is not organized very beautifully for that reality. So, so I have a notion I call nations of choice. Um, best example may be Burning Man, right? Now, you can't imagine the whole country running like Burning Man because I don't think anything would work or get paid for or whatever, but, but we take capitalism and money so for granted here again, waving at Grace and Michael and others. We take capitalism so for granted that we can't imagine other ways of being in the world successfully and thriving, right? So, so what, does, what does that look like? And I think that nation states may lose power over the next 100 years because people start joining nations of choice, which means my trust and affiliation are principally with my nation of choice. And I might put a badge on my, you know, avatar or whatever that says, I, I will, you can trust that I will act according to the principles of and mores of my nation of choice being whatever. Uh, and it could be 4chan as your nation of choice, in which case I might like to step around a little bit. I don't but know. I see that kind of as, a, as one of the potential ways in which the metaverse kind of, kind of evolves and, and our digital futures influence our physical futures. And, and by the way, everything I just said could be used beneficially. So we could pretend that the world is divided up into watersheds. And we could create an alternate governance structure. This is, this is I haven't even written this down any place, but it's, a, it's totally on my wish list. We could create a global alternate governance structure along watersheds with resource sharing and a whole bunch of other sorts of things in, a, in some completely different setting. 
And the more people we attracted into it who started doing this, the better. You could make an argument, Charles, I'm coming back to you and, and the communities in crypto. There's very likely a couple communities in crypto thinking that same way and deciding that crypto is the way to sort of manage the flows of value. But my fear is that most of the bulk of the others are not. And in fact, are doing horrible, wasteful, like stupid things uh, that aren't necessarily that helpful. What's fun is like writing code just takes your time. N none of this requires a whole lot of money. It requires people of reasonable will coming together to sort these things out and, and then glue all the moving parts together. Unfortunately, all the moving parts are really, really complicated. And how do you do the glue? And that's the conversation that I think we want to have next, but I'll, I'll leave that for another and, time. And the glue's got to be really light. It has to be more like Post-its than uh, Loctite, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it has to be restickable stickies, which were an accidental discovery and not the thing that's bonded. You know, you want late binding and you want gentle binding. Yeah. Uh, or maybe for... conduits rather than glue even. Yeah, exactly. Well, we are all just energy trapped in fields. Right. And, uh, you know, I'm no physicist by far, but, but that's a nice analogy also to what's happening here is that, is that, you know, regimes are sort of energy fields themselves. Exactly. Beautiful way to the end. I feel like that. this could go on for hours. Maybe, maybe we'll have to have Jerry back another time, but, uh, I don't I'd know like that to... I'll ever be this eloquent or quick, but. Well, I, I'd like to thank you for your eloquence and your and your quickness today and for showing up as our, our guest. It's been a pleasure to have you. Really stimulating conversation, which I kind of knew would happen. Um, thanks, everybody who's joined us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for all the great questions from everybody. It's been awesome.